Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome. I'm thrilled to see you all here on this very interesting post-election day with a fantastic speaker to dig into some of the most pressing issues of this election cycle and looking forward. And before I turn to a question and answer session with our esteemed author here, I'd like to invite Joan Harris to introduce Rebecca. For those of you who don't know Joan Harris, she has a remarkable history in the arts and culture here in Chicago and nationally. She's uh, served on the commission, the National Endowment for the Arts. She's received the National Medal of Arts from President Obama. She leads many cultural events and cultural institutions here in the city of Chicago, from theater to visual arts. Uh, she was uh, a key founder of the Irving Harris Foundation and led that and has intimately connected with our school and the University of Chicago, being a crucial member of the Harris Council and a supporter and booster of our school and so many institutions that we value in the city. We're so lucky to have Joan on our team and really lucky to have Joan introduce Rebecca here today. So I, I turn the microphone over to Joan. I'm so glad to see such a nice turnout. Uh, most of you from the Harris School, or, or for, I'm just curious to know whether you're university-wide. How many Harris students are here? Great. Right. I'm so glad. It's working, huh? <laughs> um, you know, if we'd been here yesterday, I would have made a very different kind of introduction. Uh, Rebecca Sive is somebody who knew long before last night and long before the 2016 election what narrow slots women have had to crawl through and wiggle through to get some recognition. Last night's election was really quite interesting because a very large number of women were elected uh, and so I'm very pleased with, with that uh, event. Um, today, we're here to celebrate Rebecca's, the public, publication of Rebecca's book, uh, Voter In, Your Guide to Electing Our First Woman President. And I don't know whether Rebecca, I'm sure you did, but the rhythm resonated with me and I thought, we've made a huge jump from locker up to voter in. <laughs> and it. Um, it, it, did, it wasn't lost on, on me when I, when I read that. Rebecca has been, uh, she has a remarkable career and I never know which Rebecca I'm going to find when I see her because she's been a political activist, she's been a writer, a speaker, a student, a teacher, and uh, it's a pleasure always to know what she's done. If I gave you all of the things that she's done, we'd be here to the next election. <laughs> so I just wanna say a few things about the things that Rebecca has done. At the Harris School of Public Policy, she was a founding program and academic director of its Women in Public Leadership. And she's had a very long trail of accomplishments from her uh, undergraduate days at Carleton College to her graduate days at UIC. She's worked for Presidents Clinton and Obama and has received numerous awards, including the United Negro College Fund, the JCs, and the WCA. But I want to tell you something else about Rebecca Sive that you may not know. I want to share with you her passion that she has often shared with me for ceramics and for the women who are the makers of ceramics. 
If you go to Rebecca's home, you will see tremendous evidence of her loyalty and support to women artists, and that means a great deal to me. I never know which Rebecca I'm gonna find when I find her, as I said. It could be the intellect, the passionate activist, the warm people connector, or the art lover. But it seems to me that anybody who could design a roadmap for how to elect our first woman president has to have all those things at once, and I think you're gonna find she's gonna bring all of that to you. So, Rebecca, it's all yours. Thank you. And we're going to have um, plenty of time for question and answer, some started by me, but then we'll turn the mic over to you. I'll also be thinking of your questions, but before we get started, Rebecca's going to give us an overview of this impressive work. Thank you. Um, I guess I, I'm having this feeling I should quit while I'm ahead here. <laughs> I'm sure you're sympathetic. Uh, before I go into the book, my, uh, after I graduated graduate school, I was fortunate uh, to meet Irving and Joan when I had my first professional job at the American Jewish Committee, actually working on women's issues. And I have been so fortunate, as you have just heard, to have had uh, Joan's support and friendship um, 40 plus years. So it, it's a pretty wonderful thing. And I say that to you also because I think that for those of us who are committed to public policy and social justice and public leadership, uh, it's so important to surround ourselves with people of different generations and experiences. And uh, I feel that in great part, what I've been able to do is because I've sort of made it my business. Gee, can I make this person? And can I get to know her? And can I learn from her? Uh, and that is also why I thought I wanted to try to write the book. Um, I'll tell you quickly why, just to set the context. For those of us who've been involved in uh, women's movement issues and rights, as Joan has also been for all these years, we've seen a gradual uh, positive move of more women in public leadership. We can get into greater detail. And of course, in 2008, we hit uh, a remarkable place that was uh, the uh, primary campaign of a black candidate and a woman candidate, the primary campaign for the presidency in a major American party. That had never happened before. That's only 10 years ago. Uh, and then, of course, we had, we elected our first black president. We subsequently uh, in, had a woman lead the national ticket as the presidential nominee. These are no small accomplishments, of course. And what I thought as I reflected on them all is that you know, this shows the power of uh, voices of change, of people who are committed to diversity in uh, decision making and the sharing of public power. So after uh, Clinton was defeated, not in the popular vote, I want to note, we did elect our first woman president in 2016. Um, I thought, well, there are lessons to be learned here. We've done this once, we can do it again. And I was mobilized to, um, try to write an inspirational book, which I hope you will find this to be, by the women's marches, which were sort of proof that it wasn't only those of us who've been active for years and sort of fighting the fight and marching and petitioning and doing all that we do, but it was millions and millions of American men and women who were mobilized to act uh, and work for change. And what I saw at the Chicago March in 2017 uh, was the words and the wisdom on tens of thousands of posters uh, written and designed and created by every woman, not only the famous, not only the fortunate, but everyone who expressed their view. I photographed it, I went home, I thought about what can I do with these photographs other than you know, share them on my Facebook page and, uh, or Instagram or something. And I thought, they're not bad. Um, and just to, the short version of the longer story is, I sat down to see whether I could, uh, and this is key to the book and key to, I think, what we're about today. I sat down to think about how can I, so to speak, use the words and the imagery of every woman and every man to, number one, make the case for why we should really elect our woman president, 
right away, or ASAP? And secondly, what is the roadmap for doing that? So voter in is both um, a case statement and a how-to, and it is uh, couched in the uh, words and images of uh, women and men who marched here and who shared their wisdom with us. And you'll see those graphic uh, images as you look at the book. Um, I think that's all I'll say at the moment. And I just want to say that uh, as a former lecturer, I'm thrilled to see so many people interested in this topic and here today. Uh, it didn't seem like that was always the case at the Harrod School. Although when I first uh, came along and had the good fortune to teach, I learned that the majority of alums are women. So I thought, well, now there's some untapped resource. I'm sure Kate's figuring that out. <laughs> Thank you. Wonderful. So, so the book has all sorts of practical tips for what individuals can do to get involved. And I want to come back to those. But I want to start with the major premise of the book, which focuses on electing the first woman president. Right. And why did you feel it was really important to focus on that one office? What do you think that the spillover effects of having the first woman president would be throughout our system? The, the spillover, the reason to focus, and thank you for starting with this, Kate, is because women have not had executive political power in American government in any measurable uh, degree. And that's, uh, you know, as you look at the data on this, and I know you all are interested in the data, you will see that the incremental progress of women in public office has primarily been in legislative positions. There's been some movement of women into appointed executive positions, um, but the basic truth is that women mayors, women governors, women county board presidents, women AGs are very few and far between. One of the good things that happened last night is we elected some uh, more women governors in some very unexpected places. So I thought that the, the focus on the presidency would be the way of capturing that idea and discussing it. And that if I were able to construct an argument about why it would be important to have a woman president, that would um, uh, also uh, suggest why it's important to have these women governors and mayors and so on. Um, and I can tell you why I think that's important, but the focus on executive office I think is key. There's no reason why fairness doesn't dictate that women should hold those jobs as well as men. Uh, not to mention that having women in those positions will uh, diversify the decision making in really important ways. And I guess lastly, I would say on the substantive importance of it, uh, and you all probably know this, but um, it, is all, it has only been as women have moved into government that there has been a systematic focus on policies and uh, legislative proposals. Uh, Women-headed households. What would happen if, if we looked at the policy solutions that we might uh, figure out and implement if we were to focus on those women heads of households and what we might do to actually make sure they have safe schools and good schools and meaningful work near their homes and not working odd hours for low wages and continuing at 71 cents on the dollar. The notion is that the first reason to do it is to make sure that the people in these positions are looking at what is it that women and girls need and what do their families need and going with that is if we have a commitment to the poorest among us, we will disproportionately aid those people. Um, I guess the second thing as far as proposals and legislation, I mean, and this is your area of expertise, is uh, you know, in administrative actions um, that executives are able to take. So, you know, the, when Barack Obama was stymied by the Republican Congress, as you probably know, he started issuing executive orders. And those reflected his policy positions. A woman president would be able to do the same. And I believe the odds are she would issue orders that would be a benefit uh, to women and girls. Uh, and I guess the last thing, and you also know this, I do too from my own um, government experience, and I know Joan does from hers, you're sitting at those tables, right? You're sitting in the mayor's office, as Joan was as commissioner, and yourself in the White House, and I as a commissioner also. 
And in my case, many times, this goes back a ways, uh, I was the only woman at the table. And that wasn't a good thing, right? I mean, why not have a diversity of female experience, whatever the decision is? So uh, whether it's in my case, I was at the park district, and so let's think about swimming pools, and let's think about access to playgrounds, and let's think about uh, you know, all of the things that the mothers who use these parks want. Um, so I think there's, uh, it's so important just to have that uh, context in which women are also gathered. Um, so I, I guess those would be the two big reasons uh, that I think about. So you mentioned a diversity of experience, and you also mentioned some surprises from last night. We certainly, we now have a, a record number of women serving right. in Congress, in the, right. the House and the, the Senate together, and there were some surprising victories, there were some expected victories, there were some surprising and expected losses. What did you think were the biggest surprises from last night's mm -hmm. results? What things were you really excited about? What races were you disappointed about? How, how did it play out for you? Um, so I want to say, I was thinking about this question because I had the good fortune to see these questions in advance. <laughs> thank you. Thank you for that. That one is not written down. That. Thank you very yeah. much. Um, but Joan and I had a chance to talk about this as well. Um, I want to say two words. Stacy Abrams, right? So uh, if you think, um, there are many wonderful stories from last night. There is a gay go male governor of Colorado, the state where the baker didn't want to bake a cake for gay people, right? Um, there's a Democratic woman governor of Kansas. Um, think about that. Uh, there are two Muslim women going to the Congress from two different states. There are two Native American women going to the U.S. Congress. Um, and I could go down. There is a down the list. Uh, but uh, to me, the Stacey Abrams race and her continuing fight today to have a runoff because she feels that not all the votes were counted and given the evidence, I think she's probably right. To me, the Abrams experience, and she as a person, represents the victory. Um, so I was old enough to sit at the family dinner table when the Civil Rights Act was passed. I was 14 years old. And we talked at our family dinner table about what that meant. Um, 10 years later, my husband was working with uh, musicians in Chicago, mostly uh, who had grown up in Mississippi and had not had the chance to vote, go to school, get good jobs. Um, and I saw firsthand as a very young woman what uh, systemic racism and sexism had meant in our country. Um, so I look now, and yes, it's 50 years later, but who would have dreamed that uh, Stacey Abrams would even exist? And whether she wins or not, Andrew Gillum is a similar story. Mike Espy is in a runoff in Mississippi uh, for the US Senate. Uh, there's just a legion of examples. And what I would say as in, uh, with one of my hats on, the political activist hat on, is most people don't uh, win the first time out, right? Now Abrams and Espy and Gillum are all very experienced politicians. But, and I don't know whether they won the first time out. But if we think any of them are going away, they're not. Uh, so I think that that's the other wonderful story about last night. In addition to the diversity of voices that are going to be in our governments, uh, it is the idea that tens and tens of thousands of people stepped up, men and women, to run for office. They put their hearts into it, they put their brains into it, and they're not going away. And I think that it's sort of like a, as they stand there and as they try again, they will encourage others. Uh, and the last thing I would say about it is I think that one of the good things about the system is you, know, you only have to win by one vote, right? You don't have to convince everybody. But once you're there, beginning as a candidate and then as an official, 
you have a platform. Uh, and all of those tens of thousands of people now have a platform. There are, uh, I think, something close to a third of the women who were nominated for right. uh, the House were women of color, which was a, a remarkable fact. What do you see as some of the barriers that are still faced by women, people of color, underrepresented groups in achieving these offices? Right. Well, so I guess the way I think about it uh, is that there is, tragically, uh, systemic sexism in our institutions at the same time as there is systemic racism and discrimina discrimination against uh, people um, who may be disabled or, or uh, in some other way unable to fully engage, not fully engage because they don't want to, but just because of the nature of their particular circumstance. I mean, if the school, if you want to go to the school board meeting and there's not a ramp up to the, to the room, how are you going to participate in that meeting and say what you have to say? Um, so I guess what I think is that I am always, I'll give you one personal example, one example from friends. Um, I'm always in awe of my friends uh, who fight those who try to overcome those barriers every day, as well as the sort of more normative ones like sex discrimination. And I, I give you one example because she's such a role model, I think, for all of us. Her name is Marka Bristow. She founded Access Living, a friend of Joan's and mine. And she uh, hurt herself as a young woman uh, and is in a wheelchair uh, and has become a worldwide voice and has been for years on issues of disability rights. And I will tell you that when I, whenever I think about this, I think, well, and I'm feeling, oh, sorry for myself, you know, like get over it, right, you know? And at the same time, recognizing, for instance, as a Jewish person, uh, that we now are experiencing a level of discrimination in this country that Jewish people didn't think they would. Um, if you were to ask. So I think that there are these overt forms of discrimination. Some of them are systemic. Some of them you experience one-on-one. -on -one. Um, but I, I, I kind of feel whenever I'm low, as I said, I look to my friends who are such role models. And I also remember this, and this goes back to something I just mentioned. I always think about my commitment to my home here. And I think that there's always something to do you know, so what if my favorite person didn't get elected or whatever, or pick for this job that I was helping her try to get? Um, there's always work to do in our communities, and in that work you are leading, and in that work you are overcoming barriers. So I would just say to you, um, think of it that way, and maybe I would add one other thing. Uh, I was, uh, and Joan and I were talking about this also, we were reflecting on Lauren Underwood's victory last night, which is a remarkable one. Uh, you probably all have read about it. 31 years old, nurse, uh, beat, I think, six other candidates in the primary, now is a member of Congress. Um, she and Alexandria are now like 29 and 31, and there they're going to be, you know, uh, one from New York, one from Chicago. But we were taught we had to sort of wait our turn, right? go do this, then go do this, first run for state rep, then run for state senate, then maybe think about Congress, and what happens? By that time, you're 60 years old, and the guys have given it to the guys, <laughs> right? So what I want to say about these barriers is take a, take a page, I guess, from the Lauren playbook, right? I mean, she didn't let it stop her, right? You know, just went for it. And I'm sure she would have said, had she lost, then it was a close race. I'm going to go for it again. So, so that, that's a great transition to some of the more practical steps that right. you outlined for things that we can all be doing. Mm -hmm. not, not everyone's going to run for elected right. office, although we hope that lots of people do. Right. What advice would you give to those of us in the room now about things that we can do starting today? Um, so, as I said, when I was kind of describing the book, the first half is this case statement. This is why trying to elect a woman president makes sense. 
and make sense now. And then the second part is the how-to. And I also share the how-to within this sort of these thematic ideas. So I wanted to show that there isn't just one thing that any one of us can do, but many things. And I begin, and actually a friend of mine was, she was reading the book and she was kind of surprised. She said she was expecting all this sort of very technical kind of thing and, you know, all of that. And she said, the first thing you talk about is having a party with your friends. And I said, yeah. And she said, well, why is that? So I pointed out to her uh, what is the, at the essence of the steps I recommend, which is that each of us is an agent of change, right? It isn't you but not me, or you but not me. All of us are. And we each have circles of friends and acquaintances, colleagues at work, colleagues in school, people we may not know, but we're going to find a way to meet. So my basic uh, view of the steps we can take, um, I was trained as a historian, but I was also trained in Alinsky organizing, I'm proud to say. And um, in Alinsky organizing, one of the principles is you organize the people around you on an issue that you all care about. And if the issue is bad hot dogs, I think this is an example from one of his books, you organize around bad hot dogs, right? And then people develop a sense of their power to make change that matters to them, and they develop a sense of exp a level of expertise about how to go about making change. So the steps in the book, in a nutshell, and hopefully you'll all buy a book and read it, um, but the steps in the book in a nutshell, are essentially this idea of seeing yourself as an agent of change, figuring out what changes you most want to see in the world around you, and then taking your expertise, writing, speaking, researching, canvassing, fundraising, whatever it is, and applying those, school, those skills uh, to the change that um, you want to see. Um, and one other piece of it that I do talk about is the importance as you do that yourself, is aligning yourself with others who feel similarly. And um, it's kind of amazing, and I'm sure some of you have experienced this, um, not how little work you can do, but, but it's really not a huge amount of work before people in your community or your organization or your school group or the campaign you volunteer are going to recognize that you're committed to taking these steps and are going to ask you to do more. And then all of a sudden, not only are you a catalyst for change, you are a leader. And with that comes a whole other uh, set of opportunities uh, to be active. So I'm going to ask one more question and then I'm going to turn to you. So marshal your questions now. Uh, you, you mentioned one shift that you've seen in uh, people not being bound to waiting their turn and, and mm -hmm. paying their dues in quite the same way as perhaps in past waves. Mm -hmm. Have you seen other changes, whether it's generational changes or changes in the way that we communicate with each other and mm -hmm. self-organize that you think have implications for the next generation of rising leaders? Well, my favorite one, I guess I would say, since I'm a writer and I've always been uh, a rabble rouser at the same time, uh, is we all own our own printing press now. That wasn't the case when, for instance, when, when I first came to uh, Chicago and started organizing, um, if I told you how old school we had to do things, you would like die. You would just, you know, I had index cards with people's names and phone, I mean, Joan's laughing, but we know we did this, right? We didn't have that phone, right? And not only the phone that would organize our work for us so magnificently, but enable us to meet, uh, to, to uh, engage so many more people. Um, and I do think of it as a printing press because I think that what we're talking about here is um, engaging other people in the ideas we have and in the commitments we've stated. So it's sort of a cliche to say technology, um, but I do think that. I, I think that um, there's no substitute, for instance, for door-to-door -door, you know, canvassing. You have to talk to people. Uh, but at the same time, then you could go home and write a book about it and hand it out to all those people and publish it yourself. Um, so I, I think that's, to me, the biggest change, uh, along with this uh, desire not to necessarily make, wait one's turn, 
which most times is good. Um, I guess I would say one other t thing about the change. Um, and I was reflecting on this the other day. I, I remember, as assertive as I am, uh, as committed as I am to my agenda, which fortunately I share with others, I could name times in my career here in Chicago, which began in 1973, in which a man who was similarly situated was able to do something that I didn't get to do. I was at least as well qualified. And I attribute that primarily to discrimination, but I also attribute it to my own sense of, oh, I always have to be polite and nice. And some of you who know me may find nice hard to believe, but I really am. Um, and stepping back and uh, not, 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 you know, just, oh, this is the right role. And in the back of my mind was something my father, who was a, a great public official and leader, had said to me when I was 16. And he and my mother gave me a set of pearls, kind of wonderful. But they also said to me, or my father also said to me, now men will stand up when you walk in the room. And so that was fine, but what's that about, right? And I'm not saying that shouldn't happen, that's up to each of us to decide, but it, it did have to do with the respective roles of men and women, right? Women didn't stand up when men walked in the room to take charge, right? So there is, even among those of us who have tried very hard to be independent actors um, I, I, and been relatively successful at it, I think there's always been this sense. And your generation and your generation, I think that's changed, and I'm very grateful for that. Um, well, that's a great note to turn to you for your questions. Hi, Pearl. Mm -hmm. So it's no longer about being a woman. It's now being looked at as a young person who's trying to elevate herself and trying to make a change, which actually affects a lot of people in the community or in society or a country as a whole. Looking at the, the development that America has made in terms of empowering and cheering on women in politics, how would you say um, we can now actually mold men to try and understand that it's not just being about a woman, but women taking leadership to provide for social equality and actually it's not about us trying to prove a point that we women do so, but it's about us proving that we are also worthy of being a part of development in our nation. So, so uh, I, I guess what I would say is this is an important issue about how we can reach a common level of understanding among men and women. Um, the, I would say from the perspective here, I don't really, I wouldn't presume to speak about things globally. Um, millions of American men of all kinds voted for Hillary Clinton. Uh, millions and millions of American men voted for women candidates last night. So I think there's powerful evidence uh, that a lot of men do understand that women have something to contribute that's important to public policy making. Um, at the same time, and this is something I talk a lot about in my first book, which is essentially a guide for women running for office, um, at the same time, you have to call it when you call it out if you have to, right? So it, it's not, um, it's about being treated equally. If you're sitting at that table 
and you're not being treated as a man who was saying what you were saying would be, then I think you have to say that that's the case and, and insist upon equal treatment. And, you know, if there are some people who don't want to engage in, you know, uh, treating others equally, then, you know, they, they just, they get called out. They, you can try to convince them otherwise. Uh, you can uh, overpower them with your arguments and your, uh, your way of proceeding. I don't think there's any special duty that women have to make men feel better about, okay, we're, we're gonna be here and you better get used to it. I mean, it's, I think, when I think about that, I think about back in grammar school, when I watched, this was a really indelible memory about playing kickball in the third grade. Um, and the guys, you know, the guys would just sort of shake it off and the girls, you know, and, we, and I, I don't know what I was thinking, I was eight years old, but, I went to all my girlfriends in my class and I said, you know, we're going to play kickball too and we're going to be as hard <clears throat> out about it as the, our boy friends are. And, you know, we're, we're not going to take no and we're not going to take lack of opportunity. Because the first idea they had proposed was there was only going to be one kickball team and they were going to pick three girls from the class. And the rest of the girls weren't going to get to play at all. So another, uh, this is a really important question and another issue that it raised in my mind was uh, how the U.S. compares with other countries and in fact we've seen a lot more uh, women leaders in other countries around the world than we've seen in the U.S., not to bring everything back to the U.S., but we're falling in the rankings in terms of the representation right. of women and other underrepresented groups in our government compared to other countries that seem to be making faster strides. Do you have any sense of why that is? I don't. I, yeah, this is what, I mean, somebody here needs to like really, or more than one person, dig in. But when I did, you know, in the research I did for the book, uh, the women executive leaders that I identified and talk about in the book, um, besides hereditary leaders like Queen Elizabeth, uh, Margaret Thatcher, Golda Meir, Indira Gandhi, for instance, they are in parliamentary systems. They were, uh, came to executive leadership in parliamentary systems. Uh, you know, only their party had to pick them. And as it happens right now, I'm reading this very long, but very good biography of Golda Meir and how she did what she did. It's a remarkable story. Um, but, and I wouldn't say it was easier, it didn't sound easier from reading it, but I think that some of these other countries also have parliamentary systems. So that's not the whole thing, mm. but I certainly think it's part of it. Questions? Hello. Hi. My name is Leah Castleberry. I'm a first year MPP at Harris. And my question is, do you think that the first female president will have to come out of the Democratic Party? And if so, why or why not? And what that may look like um, in our very uh, politically divisive time in our country right now. No, oh, that's a great question. Thank you. Uh, thank you. So there are, uh, so to speak, viable women candidates for the presidency on both sides of the aisle. Uh, so there's, I don't have much question in my mind that women on both sides will take a serious look at this and probably engage. Um, the data from last night supported the data we've seen previously, which is that people who vote Democratic are more sympathetic to women office holders than people who vote Republican by many uh, degrees. Um, so the odds favor, I think, our first woman president being a Democratic woman. On the other hand, and I, it's hard to say because the, the 13 or so states that are decisive in the Electoral College context, you know, think about the big states, Ohio, Pennsylvania, Wisconsin, Michigan, all went for Trump in 2016, right, by, you know, tiny voter margins. And um, so it's conceivable that, you know, if a Republican woman were nominated, 
uh, particularly a woman who is pro-choice and speaks to uh, white college-educated women who are now a real force to be reckoned with, um, as well as uh, some college-educated white men, not a lot according to yesterday's data, could win. So it, it's Wisconsin elected a Democratic governor last night. Um, all right. Um, Michigan, yay, elected a Democratic woman governor last night. Uh, Pennsylvania elected four women to its congressional, de uh, Democratic women to its congressional delegation when it had none before. Uh, Ohio, a wonderful man, graduate of University of Chicago Law School, Richard Cordray, happened to be a classmate of my husband's, um, did well but lost. So in the race for governor. So um, I, it's hard to say right now. Um, and I think the other important variable that we can't know about today is if you look at the trajectory of President Trump's uh, candidacy and campaign, he didn't run on issues. You know, he didn't run on policy positions. I mean, he picked a couple sort of alarming issues and said, I'm going to take care of you. I'm oversimplifying a very complicated topic. And people responded to that. And he's not the only one who could do that, left or right. So if you look back in political history, for instance, look at Huey Long. Do people know who Huey Long was? Raise your hand. Yeah. Uh, probably, in my mind, the best uh, guidance for how you can, from here, get to here. But he did the same. But he talked about issues like having rows into the Cajun country where there had never been roads and books in every elementary school, no matter how poor the school system was. So there are ways to uh, simplify the issues and run it in a, a very compelling campaign, uh, which are open to either Democrats or Republicans. Great. I saw another question there. Hi, my name is Sarah Claudia. I'm a second year MPP at Harris. Um, my question is actually pretty similar or builds upon this. Um, I was wondering how you personally weigh the costs and benefits of voting for a woman who might support policies you disagree with, so probably namely a Republican woman. Um, and furthermore, if we expect women politicians to disproportionately support a set of progressive policies, uh, do we perhaps run the risk of collapsing women into one-dimensional political actors? <laughs> Uh, to go with the second question first, people who believe in progressive policies, this is my view and you've asked for my view, um, believe in social justice for everybody, not just the fortunate few. I don't see how anyone who is that kind of a person can be collapsed into a one-dimensional person, male or female. On your first question, um, my view of how to, uh, as a voter and as an activist, of how to think about who I want to support, male or female, um, black, white, whatever, is a person who cares about the well-being of other people and acts on it. If they don't do that, it doesn't matter. Who cares if they win or they don't? That's my view. So when I look at women candidates and men candidates, that's what I look, about in the, look at in the first instance. In the second instance, um, I am a single issue voter, uh, proud to be one, and that is if you're not pro-choice, I don't vote for you. And the reason for that in my mind is very clear. Um, unless women are able to control their reproductive destiny, they can't participate in public life, uh, they can't participate in the workplace in the way they may want to. Uh, now, I know there are people who don't share my view, they think being a single issue voter is wrong, uh, but that's how I see it. Um, I'll just tell you one story on this, along these lines, since you all have figured out how old I am already. Um, <laughs> I was married before Roe v. Wade was the law of the land. I went to college before Roe. And in my freshman, fall freshman year of college, 
in Northfield, Minnesota, one of my classmates got pregnant. Her father was a junk man. They had no money. She was there on a full scholarship. So the rest of us put our money together and put her on a bus from Northfield, Minnesota to Rapid City, South Dakota, so she could get an illegal abortion. That was the only option she had. We didn't have the money to send her to New York, for instance, where abortion was legal. Um, her life was forever changed by her ability to make that decision, to act on it, to have the support of her friends. So I think that um, there are other experiences I could share with you, but to answer your question, I, I think that it's the duty of every voter to think about how can I, in my little way, with my vote, um, which is a big way, help other people? So that's how I look at that. Thank you. I saw a question here. Yes? Yeah. Um, it's a little similar in kind of thinking about um, potential like a, f a female president as a one-dimensional actor, but specifically after they're voted in. I think after President Obama was elected, and I think there's a lot of pressure in being the first anything, right? Um, and being the first black president, I think he had expectations on both sides. Um, many people thought he didn't do enough for um, his right. black constituents, and he had on the other side who thought um, that that was the only thing he was focused on. To what extent do you feel that the first female president is going to have to face that, and uh, how is she not going to reduce down to just that singular identity of her being a woman? This is, thank you so much. I mean, all the questions are great. This, I, actually, one of my girlfriends, when we were watching the returns last night, um, one of my, girlfriends is an African-American woman. We've been friends for over half our lives. Um, and we were discussing exactly this point last night as we were uh, watching and thinking about all these women and where they might go, including running for president. And actually, she and I didn't entirely agree. Um, as, a, as an African-American person, she was saying, I understood why President Obama didn't want to be the, quote, black president. And I understand why a woman who might become president one would, might not want to be the woman president. Mm -hmm. But I think those are sort of, and, and those are sort of um, ideas that take us down a dead end street. The, the, the street that isn't a dead end is what kinds of public policies do these people uh, develop and make into law, right? So if you were to look at President Obama's uh, record, you would see certain things, starting with the Affordable Care Act. How can anyone say that in, in, in thinking through that policy, in getting it passed, in developing all the regs, imperfect as it may be, um, and obviously your dean can speak to this. Um, how could anyone say he wasn't acting in, in developing that legislation on behalf of his own people? And so I think that that's the same duty that a woman would have. You know, Maybe the first woman president would have come up with the Affordable Care Act because she knew how uh, women experienced the health system, which is sometimes not in an equal fashion. So uh, there's the policy, looking at the policies. And then I think secondly is looking at the, the rhetoric of those people and just sort of seeing whether in their rhetoric they take it upon themselves to find ways to talk about the universe of people. And the way that President Obama did that was talking about we have more in common than not. Some people may disagree with that. We can share our hope in a better nation. People could identify with that. My guess is that the first woman president would do something similar, that she would you know, uh, find those policies and find those messages uh, that speak to all kinds of people, and in particular, of course, to the women like her 
whose problems she wants to help solve. And there could never be anything the matter with that, as far as I'm concerned. So then this excellent cluster of questions really highlighted the entangled issues of access to positions of authority for people who are from traditionally underrepresented demographic groups versus the views that those people might have and you know policies that you want to support from a policy perspective. Those sometimes line up and they sometimes don't line up. And if there were, uh, if everyone had equal opportunities to be represented and to be in positions of leadership, maybe we wouldn't have to talk about which dimension you care about more. But in the current state of play, you may face trade-offs, we may face trade-offs between uh, the attributes of a person that we want to see represented versus the views that we think are the right policies for the office. And, and it sounds like there's some, you, you're reconciling that for many issues, but do you feel that tension sometimes? I, I actually, uh, I, in my um, experience in public office, I actually found some days to my chagrin <laughs> Um, that I had to um, sort of sit back and be somewhat more patient. I mean, that was one sort of relatively modest level of dealing with these mm -hmm. tensions. And stuff. Everything can't happen at once, right? Um, and uh, both Joan and I served Mayor Washington, and he was, you know, get up and go and make big changes kind of a guy. But it was also true that he was a masterful politician. And so I, I can admit to like more than once calling him up and just saying, this is wrong. You know, why can't we do something about this right now? And fortunately for me, I had a relationship with him where I could say that, but he said, well, just, we have to proceed this way. So I think when these tensions come into play with people who have these uh, public leadership responsibilities, maybe the first thing is sort of to look at the issue or to look at the policy and the context and say, well, if it, you know, how can we just keep moving? Um, on the other hand, I would say, I, for uh, every day is election day, I interviewed Barbara Curry, who is uh, the recently retired state rep from this community and only woman so far, majority leader of the Illinois House. And Barbara was in the legislature from 79 until, what year is this? Long time, and I asked her, how did she deal with Springfield for all those years? and the sort of incremental process of change, and not to say the frequent defeat on policies she really cared about. And she said, I love the process, I'm committed to the issues I'm working on, and one ought not to become a public official if one isn't um, committed to this, however incremental it is, process. Because I had admitted to her that if I had ever gone to Springfield, I would have shot myself. You know, I was like, <laughs> no, this isn't happening. So the, the point there is commitment to that process, but also recognizing for each of us where these tensions exist, what's the right role, right? For some of us, it's to be the external advocate. For others, it's to be right there in the middle of the institution. Um, so you have a role and I have a different one. I probably can say things that you might think, but don't say, I'm speculating. Um, but, but thinking about the role one can have as a public leader and, and the best way to manage the tensions that sometimes come up. Well, I think that's a great note for us to end on, and I hope that you'll join me in thanking Rebecca Sides for her remarks today. As, as you see, copies of Rebecca's book at the back of the room. Rebecca will be available to sign and discuss. So I hope you get a chance to peruse and go forth and take some of that great advice.